Do you know what they call alternative medicine that's been proven to work? Medicine. Welcome to the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast, a show about energy healing, holistic, and plant medicine. Our passion is healing on all levels. You'll hear guests from doctors, yoga teachers, energy healers, researchers, coaches, and real people who've recovered from serious debilitating health conditions, getting to the root of the problem and solving it. And this is not medical advice. Welcome to the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast. And now your host, William Dickinson. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast. Today, we are joined by Brooke Bounds, who is, she's definitely an expert in self-sabotage. She's got her own book. She's a transformational speaker, accredited trauma coach, and as I said, author. She specifically works with women who want to find their power and confidence so they can go for their goals. But Brooke knows herself way better than I do, so I'm going to allow her to introduce herself. So Brooke, uh, how did you get into this, and why is this the thing that you chose to do with your life well I actually came into coaching purely by accident a friend of mine a few of my friends said to me you really should do it as a profession because you help us all so much you know you could really you know get into it and help lots of other people and then another friend of mine said that um she was going to go to a free like coaching weekend like a taster thing to see what it was like and I and would I go along with her because she didn't want to go on her own so I thought okay I'll go with you that'd be interesting I love to learn so I went along to this coaching thing I thought well, I already do that. I already do that. <laughs> thought, oh, okay. So then they were talking about, you know, doing the, actually the full blown coaching um, certification. So I went ahead and, and did that. And that kind of started off my journey of, of actually being a qualified coach, although I'd been coaching for a long time with, with lots of people in, in my work environment, I was coaching as well. Wow. Um, but the reason I really got into the trauma bit and the self-sabotage is because I actually grew up with a narcissistic mother. So I had a lot of trauma as well as being born with a cord wrapped around my neck, which caused medical issues. So I was, it's actually quite traumatic, my, my birth. Yeah. So sort of like from the, the get go, I was like sort of in the trauma sort of thing. So, yes. And I spent all my childhood, you know, kind of being my, my mum's puncher bag emotionally and physically mm-hmm. because of the traumas that she had um, from her childhood. And um, if you kind of like get into na- narcissism, a lot of people that are narcissists, have got such deep child inner wounds mm-hmm. that they they can't deal with. So how they deal with them is is by sort of projecting out their hurt onto other people and blaming other people mm-hmm. because it's easier and less painful than actually dealing with the trauma themselves. Um, then I went on to have a couple of narcissistic relationships because it's kind of I was a magnet to them because I've got no self confidence yet yeah. and all that sort of thing. Um, I I think if I'd have had a different childhood, I'd have been you know a really different person so I was quite a determined little child and I did something um when I was five that kind of defied medical practice because the doctor said I could I would probably never walk because the whole right side of me was was weak on my left due to the cord being wrapped around my neck I may never walk and if I did I'd never run or ride a bike but I learned to walk and um when I went back to my consultation with the doctor they said that's amazing but you won't actually ride a bike because you won't be strong enough to to balance and hold it And I can remember saying to the doctor, I will, and I'll come back and show you kind of thing. So I was quite a determined little little child at the time. But my mother shot me that kind of knowing look and I thought, I'm in trouble, you know. Mm -hmm. But And when I got home, my dad went back off to work and and she absolutely went mad at me. So how dare I embarrass her in front of the doctors? How dare I show show her up? And I can just remember kind of curling up into a little ball like this thinking, just to stay safe, I need to Mm -hmm. keep small. Mm -hmm. So I then became a very shy, quiet little girl, having no self-esteem, no confidence. And it was just constantly like chipped away at all through my childhood and then into my relationships. And then once I got into coaching, I realized, actually, I can be a voice for other women. I can help other women who haven't got that voice and, and don't know what to do about it. So I got really, really passionate because I knew what it felt like to be that unconfident person and then when I started coaching and working on myself and having therapy, I then went on to talk on stage and tell my story, inspire other people. Wow. And then, as you said, I went on to, to write my book and I actually wrote and published that in 90 days. Because Fantastic. I, just, I want to inspire other people to, to think that 
things are possible yeah. but they don't do my, my my view is you know i love clients who come to me thinking something's impossible and i can show them and get them to think from a different perspective yeah. that actually it is possible and then actually that they can also do whatever they want to do yeah you know, just because you, your family's always been that way and the past has been and it is it doesn't define your future or mm -hmm. your present time so it's thinking about how you know, I often get clients come to me and you're probably the same. Oh, well, that's the way I've always been. Or that's mm -hmm. the way my family's always been. But it doesn't have to carry on like that. It can be completely different. And that's yeah. what I'm really, really passionate about. Opening up people's minds to their different ideas and also helping them to release the trauma. Because mm -hmm. we can work a lot on our mindset and, and think, okay, I'm safe. I can do this. And cognitively, we think, okay, I'm all right to do this. But our bodies kind of go into that state of freeze because it's an automatic mm -hmm. response from a childhood trauma and our bodies are relieving that trauma. Mm -hmm. So until we release that trauma, we're not going to move forward. And that's, you know, brings into the bit about self-sabotage mm -hmm. because, you know, if our bodies sort of tense up when we go to do something and Facebook lives is always a great example to use, <laughs> you know, yeah. oh, I want to do a Facebook live because it'll help my business. It will help me get known. But the minute I think about it, I kind of real tense up. So the minute your body tenses up, your shoulders tense up, and you often kind of have this sort of fist ready. Mm -hmm. And what it's doing is letting your subconscious mind know that this isn't safe. Mm -hmm. And our subconscious mind, as you will probably already know, is main priority is to keep us alive and to keep us safe and out of pain. So it's like, okay, well, we're not going to do that Facebook Live, but your mind's going, but I know I want to do it. I know I want to do it. We know, you know, cognitively we're completely mm -hmm. safe, but our bodies are reliving that trauma from when we were younger. Yeah. So it's that... Why we self-sabotage is because we've got those inner child wounds of I don't feel good enough, I'm not worthy, I'm not lovable, or I'm not important. They're the four main inner mm. child wounds that a lot of people have. There are lots of other ones, but they're the, the not good enough is, is the, the main one that yeah. lots of people can. Well, yeah, I could do a Facebook Live, but I'm not really that good. And what will people say? What will mm -hmm. people think of me? <laughs> you know, so and then they talk themselves out of it. Yeah, and they'll do anything else. You know, like. I have lots of clients come to me and say, well, I want to eat healthy and get fit. And they've suffered for that good intention on a Monday morning, but come Monday afternoon, they're eating some, you know, kind of junk food or cream mm -hmm. cake or biscuits or things because that, that inner child wound of I'm not good enough and I need something to kind of like feel good is mm -hmm. instant gratification, that mm -hmm. emotional eating. So they end up self-sabotaging it. And also like the same with doing Facebook Lives, if people want to build their business and do something in their business, but they'll end up doing anything else. You know, they'll say, oh, I'm a great at procrastinating or I spent an hour rearranging my highlighters, you know, instead of doing that Facebook Live that would have took me five minutes yeah. to do. So it's all about how you feel about yourself and, mm -hmm. and getting curious about why you're acting that way and what thoughts are popping up into your mind. Mm -hmm. Are they actually your beliefs or are they beliefs that you've inherited from sometimes even well-meaning parents? Yes. A lot of my clients don't necessarily have like a mother like I had, I had one client who had a real issue with money, but her parents, well-meaningly, when she was little, used to pay her pennies for doing jobs around the house, but she perceived that as she was only worth pennies. Mm. So that caused wow. her to have a money mindset. Very so deep. It's, and it's, what I love to do is to raise the awareness of trauma because a lot of people think, well, I haven't had a major trauma like a car crash or I haven't been off, you know, as a soldier fighting in a war. So I'm, I'm okay. But one sentence can can cause a trauma to carry on for a long time. You know, like a teacher can say something to a child and before the age of seven, we haven't got that critical faculty to kind of like reason with mm -hmm. it. They just take it as truth. Mm -hmm. And like in my book, um, I wrote about a client that had um, a real fear about doing maths and she had to do a maths exam to, to, for a promotion. And it stemmed back to when a teacher said to her when she was younger, you're useless at maths and threw the board rubber at her and she said so I'm, I'm no good at maths and that was one sentence that affected her from the age of seven up until she was in her 50s mm, so wow. it, it's it's realizing that we all have some sort of trauma in our lives and often we process it really well but sometimes if it's not processed it can stay in our bodies and keep coming mm -hmm. up until we actually deal with it so how do you start something like this as you said it can kind of feel a bit unfair when you're born into a family that abuses you and you have a cord around your neck it's like how do you move to a place where instead of feeling like a victim like all of this is happening to you how do you take that first empowered step to begin to change these these patterns and these things that are happening in your life 
great question. Uh, well, for me, it was it was kind of a realization that hang on a minute, the common um, denominator here is me. You know, it's like my mum was a, was abusive to me. Then I ended up in abusive relationships. So mm-hmm. I need to like work on me and think about me and how I'm I'm responding to people. And I was very reactive because of the trauma that I'd had as a child. So. I was reacting because of the wounds that come up. So um, the best way I describe it is if you can imagine like and my fist is like, um, I'll talk to this through for those on the podcast, is like your brain. We, we, the front of your knuckles here is like your prefrontal cortex, which is like your logical thinking brain. And your thumb is like the stem of your brain. And this is your limbic system. And that's where your fight or flight comes from. So when somebody's having a normal conversation, like me and you are, both of our fists would be closed as such. The brain would be both talking from our, our logical point of view. But if something is triggered in us, we kind of flip our lid and we start talking from the fight or flight. Now, if you also flip your lid because I said something back to you because I flipped my lid, we're both then talking from that, that um, fight or flight and there's going to be no resolution. So what I realised was I needed to start thinking about why I was flipping my lid all the time and what I was reacting to and what was causing that. So I got really, really curious about what my thought processes were and how I was thinking and and how it made me feel, how my body was reacting. And I really want- The first step is awareness then. Yeah, it's it's being aware of of what you're saying to yourself and also how your body's reacting. Because Mm -hmm. you can say, you know, and I'm a big believer in affirmations, but if you start saying an affirmation that you don't believe, you can say that till the cows come home. It's not yes. going to actually change anything, but you, you've got to really sort of like feel it in your body. So it's thinking about how you feel about things. So when um, I started to first think about changing me, I thought, OK, are the stories true that that my mother said about me or is it was it her stories? And when you look back at it, it was what she was feeling mm-hmm. and what she was projecting onto me. You know, I was told every day of my life that I was ugly. I was even told that I didn't have the audacity to be born properly. I had that thrown in my face every wow. day, you know, that I was worthless. Nobody would love me. Never, ever to talk, talk about my medical issues because people would definitely not love me. But that was from her point of view, because with being a narcissist, she wanted the family to look perfect. So if I started talking to everybody that I wasn't perfect as she mm-hmm. saw it, it would like, you know, crumble her perfect image of her family. So she instilled in me, and it wasn't up until I was in my late 20s that I actually started telling other people what happened to me at birth, Mm -hmm. you know, because I had this thing of, like, everybody will run away and reject me, and that would have hurt my inner child wound of not being good enough and not Mm -hmm. being lovable. So I was hiding that all the time. But now I talk about it quite openly, and the more I talk about it, the more it helps other people. So, Mm -hmm. So it really is thinking about, rather than being fear of of the thoughts that come up, because a lot of times we have these thoughts come up and we sort of try and push them away and, and push them down. It's kind of welcome them in because they're letting you know what you need to work on for yourself. So it's getting curious, like, okay, so why is that thought popped up into my head? Now, one of the good examples I had was the last time I spoke on stage pre-COVID, I stood at the back of the stage getting all mic'd up and done and the little voice popped up into my head. I like to call her Gertrude or give her like a little character. <laughs> name. It always yeah. makes me smile when I yeah. think of it. She's a bit like um, a cartoon character with wrinkly stockings and, and yeah. big black glasses. And she's got a really funny voice like this. So she popped up and said, what do you think you're doing? Now, if that had been 15 years ago, I'd have probably burst out into tears and I don't know and ran into the toilet. But what I actually did instead of trying to push that away was actually what I'm actually doing is I'm going to go up on stage. I'm going to tell my story and it may inspire some people to do some things that they want to do in their lives because of what I've achieved in my life. And with that, that voice went quiet because I answered it. So people tend to run away from those thoughts in their minds. But if I actually see them, those thoughts that pop up as like a little character and you can make up your own little character and get as as vivid as you like, but think of them as like a little five-year-old child because if a five-year-old child comes to you scared, you wouldn't say, just go away, stop being silly. You would, you know, console it. You would make it feel better. You would reassure it. And that's what you need to really do with those thoughts. So whatever thoughts pop up, like, oh, what are people going to think of me? I'm not good enough. They'll think I'm ridiculous. Actually, are they going to think I'm ridiculous? No, I've studied my, my, my coaching or whatever it is. I do. I'm knowledgeable in it. I've got the skills. I know what I'm saying. So they won't think I'm ridiculous. And 
even if I just inspire one person, it's worth me actually saying what I want to say. And when you start talking like that and answering these little thoughts in your mind, you can quieten them down. So they just want reassurance because again, it's that your subconscious mind trying to protect you and making sure that you're going to be okay. So it's just kind of like checking in thinking, am I going to be okay? And you're reassuring them. Actually, you know, thanks for popping up to like, let me know that you're scared, but I've got this, you know, I've grown, I've worked on this bit of me and I'm going to be fine. Yes. I feel a bit nervous because I'm doing something new for the first time. Like the first time I was on stage, I can remember saying, you know, um, excitement and fear is feels exactly the same in, in your body and I can tell you now I'm very very excited you know, <laughs> sort of like make this, the audience laugh but it's realizing that it's okay to feel a bit you know have that nervousness in, in your stomach and feel a bit of that fear but it's getting curious as to where's that come from and, and why have you got that fear because the, the only two fears we actually born with is a fear of falling and the fear of loud noises every other fear is a fear that we, we've come accustomed to so because we've actually had come accustomed to it we can actually reverse that as well so we can actually get rid of those fears which is a is great news and one thing when I learned about that I was thinking that that's great so whatever fears I've had they're actually fears a lot of them come from my mother but they can be generational things you know like people generations back when they were in the war and stuff and things were rationed they were very, very careful with their money and worried about spending money. So a lot of people can have money issues and money mindset problems because of their grandparents and their grandparents about, you know, making sure you don't spend any money, don't waste any money and all that sort of thing. So it's realizing and getting the best thing I can say is to, to be aware of what's happening with your body and your mind and get curious as to what, why the thoughts are coming up and where them thoughts have come from. Are they actually your thoughts or are they thoughts that you had from somewhere from another adult when you was a child okay so it's about becoming aware and then changing the the thought process or the behavior pattern that is sort of running automatically by itself do you have any like tools or techniques or strategies that you could share with with everybody listening to do that because the awareness i think really is the most difficult first step when you become aware it can be very difficult yeah. But what do you do then? Okay, well, when, when you become aware, you notice that your, your body is like tensing up. It's like the first thing to do, because when people are nervous, if you notice it now and, and for everybody listening, I want you to start noticing other people when, when they look a bit nervous, what they're doing. They'll raise their shoulders, they'll kind of hold their breath and they'll kind of clench their jaw as <laughs> well. So the first thing to do is like drop your jaw, drop your shoulders, so start relaxing your body because when your body's relaxed, it's letting your subconscious mind know that you're safe. And if your heart's pounding, like my heart used to pound, if somebody used to shout my name or call my name across a room, my heart used to pound thinking, oh my goodness, what, what have I done wrong? Um, mm. How do they look upset? Because whenever my mother called my name, I was always in trouble. So that was my body reacting to my name oh. being called. So it's slowing your heart rate down. And a great way to slow your heart rate down is to do what I call the five, two, eight breathing technique. So let's breathe in through your nose to a count of 10, hold for a count of two, and then, sorry, breathe in through your nose for a count of five, not 10, hold for a count of two, and then breathe out counting backwards, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero, and repeat that a couple of times. And that will actually slow your heart rate down, which will tell your subconscious mind that you're safe because if you've got a nice resting heart rate, you're not ready to fight or flight. Because the minute you're ready to fight or flight, your, your heart rate increases, you know, and the adrenaline starts pumping, ready to either actually physically fight or to run away mm -hmm. from, from danger. So it's really getting your nervous system to sort of like calm, calm down. And another great way of doing that is, um, and I will describe it for those that are listening, um, is to cross your arms over and and actually alternatively tap your arms with your hand. And it's called the butterfly technique. You can look it up on um, YouTube. And whilst you're doing that, actually think about a place that you love to be, where you feel really, really safe, or a place that somewhere, somewhere you feel safe or somebody you feel safe with. Because what that actually does is that makes you um, think from your, your logical part of your brain rather than from the amygdala, which is your fight or flight part of your your brain it actually forces you to think logically so you can then start to think in a logical way rather than oh this is going to happen what if this is going to happen what if this is going to happen you actually think actually 
no, it's just my body responding to it. I'm completely safe and I can actually do this Facebook Live, you know, the ceiling's not going to mm-hmm. cave in, I'm not going to drop down dead, you know, and realise that you're completely safe to do what you want to do. But it's, it's a process over time and it's learning to like just calm your body down so it lets your subconscious mind know that you're actually safe to move forward. So it's very much body orientated techniques so it's not about not necessarily so much about thinking different things or doing something different it's about engaging with the body on a on a visceral yeah. physical level and using these techniques to reassure that it is safe because that's that's ultimately what it comes down to isn't it it's, it's safety yeah. and when those thoughts pop up actually ask yourself is that true so we also have a thought set up so um am i good enough then sort of say, is that true? And, and then go into it and, and think about all the times that you've done things and people have said, you know, that was really good, great. You know, so do you build up that, that memory bank of actually I was good enough when I did X, Y, and Z? You know, because we've, especially if we've been through trauma, we've been told a lot that we're not good enough. So it's actually re- changing that around to like the thoughts of that when we are good enough and thinking about those and what I often tell my clients to do is when you get somebody who says to you oh my goodness that was amazing that's just what I needed to hear write that down or screenshot that that comment they've made and keep it somewhere Mm -hmm. like on your desktop or in a notepad and when you're feeling a bit iffy like if you want to go and do another Facebook live and you're feeling a bit nervous read through all those lovely comments first so you can and it's a bit like reprogramming your mind and if you can imagine like your mind is like a, it's like a field, if you've been walking back and forth constantly in one place, you, you develop like a groove in the field. And if there's it's a field of grass, that would the grass would disappear where you keep walking back and forth and you worn it away. And that's that thought process. Oh, my goodness, I'm not good enough because you've been walking back and forth that for years. But when you start walking a new path, of actually, I am good enough because I did X, Y and Z. Yes, I am good enough. And you keep walking that path. Eventually, that new path will have, you know, the worn out grass and be a new positive groove. And, the, and where you was walking before where it wasn't good enough, that would regrow over again and, and disappear and become weak and eventually would completely disappear. So it's having that thought process. Like with me, my mum constantly told me I was ugly. So my coach said to me, sit in front of a mirror and, and start saying you're beautiful. And I thought, oh. Okay, so I'll have it again. And I went, um, and I couldn't say it yeah. with stuttering because I've got these voices. Saying, no, you're not. No, you're not. You're ugly. No, you're not. You're ugly. Because if anybody ever said to me, oh, you're beautiful, you're nice looking, I would instantly come back with, no, I'm not. I'm ugly. So I thought, okay, how can I work on this? Because, yeah, it's a good affirmation, but my brain is going, no, no, my body's like disagreeing with it completely. So, but well, everybody's always said that I've had a nice smile. And my mum never, ever mentioned my smile. So there wasn't any negative connotation with my smile. So I started off with that little baby step of, okay, Brooke, you've got a nice smile. So what else is nice about your face? And eventually over time, I got to the stage where I can actually say, yes, I'm beautiful. Now, if somebody actually does say, give me a compliment about how I look, I now just say, thank you, you know, rather than, no, I'm not, I'm ugly. (laughs) And that's how I used to actually really respond. I go, no, I'm not, I'm ugly. And it's my body jumping and responding to it as well, because that was a strong belief I had about myself. So it's, it's thinking about what really strong beliefs negatively you have about yourself and how your body reacts and and where they've they've come from. You know, is it somebody that said, you know, maybe you, you, you'd lost a you know a game at school or something and you came home and your joking uncle who's always joking about said something and not meaning to, to upset you but it kind of stuck you know maybe they said oh maybe you should try doing woodwork instead of playing football or something like that and and you that you per- perceive that as being I'm no good at football so never played football again even though you may have been great at football you just happened to have a bad day at it so it's thinking about going back and looking at where where it actually stems from because it's it getting to the root cause of it you know, because if you try and cover it up it will always keep rising up to the top until you actually deal with it and that's why we self-sabotage and um, my book um, is actually an acronym of um, self-sabotage there's 12 chapters and it goes through different chapters so you can work your way through it and work out through self-sabotage with these particular subjects that you're struggling with like one of them is forgiveness because a lot of people struggle to forgive people especially if they've had things happen to them in their life which is completely understandable 
but they struggle the hardest with forgiving themselves for how they've they've treated themselves as well. So there's a whole chapter just on on forgiving yourself. So it's thinking about you know letting go of those things because you know as they say forgiveness is a bit like holding a piece of hot coal and expecting somebody else to get burnt it would just never happen yeah. and we forgive other people for ourselves not to to let them off the hook or say that you agree with what they're doing so it's really looking at it's getting curious about how you think and the process you think about and at the same time how your body reacts to it because your body's letting you know all the time how your you're dealing with that, that trauma, whether it's gone or not. Mm -hmm. Now, I can remember years ago, if my phone rang and my mum's name popped up, I'd go <gasps> instantly, like, oh my goodness, what have I done wrong now? What did she want? You know, what did I say to her last time? But now, um, if if her, her name popped up on the phone, I think, okay, it's just, just her. You know, there's no reaction mm -hmm. in my body. You know, it doesn't bother me that, you know, if even if she now came up to me and started screaming and shouting in my face, I wouldn't flinch and go like that. I'd be like, okay, she's still dealing with her stuff and she's trying to project it onto me still. And I understand what's going on because I've healed those wounds about my mother. So it's, and once you realize that and you start to heal those wounds, you st don't start reacting. We only react to the, to the things that we haven't yet healed. That's true. So you, you're, extrapolating from that every time we are in a situation and we feel some type of elevated emotion that's a really good indicator that there's something unhealed within ourselves that yeah and it's like like with smell um i i cannot stand the smell of steak and kidney pie because i was force fed it as a child you know and it's like and it used to really make me feel physically sick but now I, I smell, I think, oh, yeah, I didn't like that as a child because mm -hmm. of that. And it's, it's a, so it's, it's, and also as well, because the same thing is like when you're happy and you smell something nice, you think, oh, yeah, that takes me back to a time when, you know, I love the smell of, of cut grass because I used to sit on my dad's lawnmower and we used to have fun ride around. So that was a nice memory. Mm -hmm. So it, it's realizing that we, we were acting to memories and that are stuck in our bodies and mm -hmm. traumatic ones will react in a way that, doesn't feel good for us you know we may get sweaty palms you may realize that you're sitting there and your fists are like clenching up really tight you know like you're ready to fight or or, or run you know and you you can feel your heart pounding and you can get your mouth will go really really dry as well because you're you're building up that adrenaline and to get ready to just just run you're even though you know logically you're safe your body is just going to react ready to to go because it wants to protect you from a perceived danger not an actual danger and trauma that's happened in the past is all about our perceived danger that we're in now not our, the actual danger we're in now okay. so a minute ago you mentioned forgiveness i think this is a, a a really big point so it's very easy to consciously say or believe that we've forgiven somebody but our body might not have and that as you say this this little child, this sort of sub-community of little people inside of us, it's one of these parts that we're not so aware of hasn't forgiven this person. What can we, how can we sort of tap into that and find that visceral level of forgiveness within the body, not just of the mind? Yeah, I, what I do is I, I help my clients a lot with this. And, and one of the things I, I suggest that they do is to, to sit down and, and write out a forgiveness letter not to give it to anybody but just to actually get it out of their system and such and I can remember one client said oh I don't, I don't think I'd be very good at this said, well just write a sentence I forgive you for and just see what happens you might write a sentence saying I forgive you for all the things you did to me in my life and that might make you feel a bit better I said but you know you might want to write a couple of pages a couple of days later she wrote back to me and said I've just wrote 11 a4 pages of forgiveness she said, I was crying my eyes out. My writing's not very clear because I couldn't really see. She said, but I could feel it all coming out of my body. So that, that's one way of, of doing it. But what I actually do is I do, um, when I actually work with the clients, I actually go and take them back to a childhood, but in a non-traumatic way so they can say things that they want to say to the person that it happened to at mm -hmm. the time. So like when I was a five-year-old, I would have loved to say, you know, stop doing them. this is wrong you shouldn't treat a child like this but I didn't because I was too scared so when I had my trauma therapy for what all I went through is it is a technique I use to help people to do that to actually 
close that loop as such, because at the moment the loop is open, and they're just constantly going round and round and round and round in this loop. But actually, when you deal with it, and, and like you said, that little inner child inside that needs needs something, I help them to like actually close that loop to, to let that five year old child, that six year old child, feel that they are loved, feel that they are heard, and feel that they are seen. So, this example with forgiveness you used was to forgive others. I find it's in some ways it's easier to forgive other people than it mm. is to forgive ourselves. Do you have any any tips for that? Because I was yeah, again the same thing. Writing a letter to yourself, mm -hmm. you know, I forgive you for you know, and write a list of all the things that that you struggle to forgive yourself for. And it's like, okay, so um, one of the examples that I often use was that when I was a teenager, because um, I caught my my mum in bed with with another man in my mum and dad's bed. Anything she said was black, I would say was white, just because I was angry and I was really, mm. really angry. And sort of like, as I got older, I felt quite bad about that. And I thought well, I shouldn't have acted like that, you know, because I'm just being as bad as her. You know. But I ended up sort of like forgiving myself. So I, I wrote a list down of everything that I felt, you know, that I, I need, I wanted to forgive myself for, even if I struggled to give myself for it. And I was like, you know, why, why do you struggle to forgive yourself for it? It's, it's asking those questions and getting curious. And again, you can write a letter to your younger self saying, I forgive you for this. You were only whatever years old. You were doing the best you could at the time. And I forgive you for it. And then whatever it is that you want to forgive yourself for, because you know, often things are said at the heat of the moment, even though I was quite a scared little girl, every now and then I would kind of like explode because yeah. the emotions had to come out. And I would say some awful things, but there's like, and, and I'm not really an awful person. I like to be nice to people. So it's, it's understanding that we do deal with things you know, the best we can with the information we've got at the time as well. So I think that's one of the big things I like to get my clients to understand. They were doing what they could, did at the time because they thought that was the best thing to do. And our bodies are remarkable uh, helping us survive and keep alive and and it's a coping me mechanism they used at the time so it was okay because it was needed at the time to get them through that that period in their life so when we start talking about that explaining that people kind of relax a bit more and I, I can actually see my client's shoulders like relaxing think, okay yeah all right I can understand that so I can I can forgive that 14 year old you know that 15 year old whatever for saying whatever they said to, to their parents or teacher or whatever as well we, you know especially when it's teenagers all the hormones are raging and we do say some things that we don't even understand ourselves sometimes so it's it's really thinking about we're and it's raising that that thought of loving ourselves enough to actually forgive ourselves as well and that's why we find it easier to forgive other people because you know especially if we've been through trauma we find it easier to love other people than it is to love ourselves so it, therefore it's easier to forgive other people than it is ourselves but that's the start of the journey and that's starting to know that you're starting to actually love yourself and, and care about that little inner child in you as well by starting to forgive yourself as well. So do you think that this is a process that you work on for your whole life? Or do you think it's possible to get to a point where you are fully healed, you've fully forgiven everybody, you've fully forgiven yourself? Is that is that attainable? I, I think we're all mainly a work in progress I think you know because different things will come up and, and trigger us off that we don't know because you know a lot of us can have really hidden hidden trauma like my dad recently passed away last September and I had a whoosh of, of trauma and stuff come up that I didn't even know was, but I think what happened was because he, he passed away and although this sounds a bit strange I know he was safe now because he suffered because of my mum as well mm -hmm. and it was like my body was saying okay now your dad's in a safe place because he's passed away it's we can now heal you know so there was mm -hmm. lots of stuff come up for me but so we we never know what's going to come up and, and we can have a trauma happen at any time in our life as well and it depends on how we process it as well so it's realizing that it's okay not to be okay as well you know mm -hmm. nobody's perfect I always work on myself I've got a coach I've got a therapist and I'm quite open about that you know and I will talk about things that I'm going through at the time like a, a lot of people know that know me know that my dad passed away they know that I, I struggled with it and that I have you know different things come up because we're all human at the end of the day so um yes we can heal a lot of things like I said if my mum come up to me now 
as far as as she's concerned those wounds have healed but you know I don't know what will happen in the future mm-hmm. you know I may have something happen yeah and it it affects me in a way that I don't mm-hmm. know about you know like my dad passed away I didn't realize it would affect me that way you know I've, I've got other relatives and friends that I'm close to something happened to them I don't know so but I've got the, the, the tools and the techniques to understand that, okay this is happening to my body so okay let's let's work through that and process it so I can process it now rather than it's being stored in my body mm-hmm. and affecting me for the next 20 years going forward so you're saying what's important isn't getting rid of all of the trauma that you've accumulated it's establishing tools and techniques to process it when some external event brings it up so instead of it yeah. just being a big mess or being repressed again you actually have the tools and techniques to sort of like pull it out process it and have it stop influencing your life negatively yeah and, and moving forward and and you using that for for good as well if you want to i mean i i often say i've turned my pain in, into my passion you know, because if it wasn't for what happened to me in my childhood, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now, probably. I'd probably do something completely different. I don't know what, though. But it's realising that we can heal from, from these things. But, you know, there's no sort of, like, timeline. Okay, well, we'll heal in, like, two days. You know, especially if you've had, like, 40, 50 years of, of trauma, you know, it may, it's a process and other things come up along the way because you can heal from, from one thing and something else may, may appear from some, something different once you've had that trauma sorted. So it's it's just a process that, that's ongoing. And yes, you can get to say safe work where now people often say to me, you never get angry or upset, but it's because I work a lot with trauma and I, I look at, at life through a, 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 the lens of trauma because I understand how everybody's got traumas. So if somebody's upset and angry at me, I won't get upset and angry back at them because I, I get curious and think, mm-hmm. I wonder what's going on in their life to make them feel that way. And one of the, the, the biggest stories that was a life changer for me was years ago, probably about 25 years ago now, I worked in a supermarket as a, in a checkout. And this is when I was a big people pleaser and I, want, I had not held any of my wounds. I had a little old lady who was like in her 80s, very well dressed, pearl earrings, pearl necklace, brooch on you know, makeup look very immaculate she came through my checkout and she she looked like I'd really upset her and I thought oh my goodness what have I done to upset her and I tried to be really really nice to her because I couldn't bear the thought of somebody being upset with me and I went home from work and thought, oh, I'm really worried this poor lady she, she I've done something to upset her and I don't know what and then I kind of I forgot about it and the next week I saw her in the, in the shop I thought please don't come through my checkout please don't come through because it was it was painful for me but she came through my checkout again and she was really like got this stern face on and she hardly spoke to me. I thought, I don't know what I've done to upset her. And I was being really, really nice to her, really chatty, really smiling. And this went on for three or four weeks. And on the fifth or sixth week, she came through with a big bouquet of flowers. I thought, yes, she's bound to chat to me about these beautiful bouquet of flowers. She's, she's, I'm bound to be able to like sort of rekindle some sort of her liking me in some way, shape or form. And I said, oh, I said, is it your birthday or a friend's birthday? And as you probably gather, I like to chat a lot. And what she said next absolutely had me speechless. She said, no, my dear, they're for you. And I couldn't even say thank you. I went, "Uh, uh, excuse me? Because my story was running that I'd upset her and she hated me. And what can I do to make that better? But her story she had running was her husband was at the end of life care. And when the carers came in to give her some respite, she used to come and do her shopping. And she quickly clocked on that if she came through my checkout, no matter how she was, I would be really smiling, really chatty. And I kept her going. And she said, these flowers are for you to say thank you because you don't realize you kept me going. But I couldn't tell you about it because I didn't want to cry in, in front of the shop, in front of everybody and embarrass myself. So thank you very much for being the most amazing cashier that I've ever known. And thank you for keeping me going. And after that, I thought, wow, you just never know what's going on in people's lives and why they're reacting the way they're doing. And it's, it's never personal to you. But because we've got wounds, we automatically take it internally and think it's our fault. We've done something wrong when we haven't. It's just how that person is and what they're dealing with at the time. So I love to tell that story because it really does sort of show that it's what's happening on people's lives, not what's what they're thinking about you that's going on. So don't always take it all in personally. So more often than not, 
you're actually insignificant in the situation. It's way more about the other person in the relationship dynamic. Yeah, That's, absolutely. Okay, very interesting. And it's very easy to, to overemphasize our own importance in other people's lives. And, make, and we think it's about us and this, this is me. I've the one that's done this. This is because of something I did or I said. And very rarely is actually the case. People are very busy. It, you, can, you can use this, this as an example. When you're, when you're out, how often are you thinking about other people's stuff? It's all about what's happening in your life. It's all about what you're thinking. And it's very rare that you'll even notice the things that other people are insecure about or the, the narratives, the stories that they're playing in, in their head because you're busy playing yours in yours. So if you're doing it, they're probably doing it. I, I, I really love that comment that you said about when somebody else is angry, you don't get angry back. I can understand, I, I get it because I've worked with a lot of trauma as well. So I really understand it. And I, I also have that tendency to go towards curiosity instead of retaliation. But even with this practice, there's still always that little inclination to, you feel that little trigger inside because you know when somebody else is, becomes triggered, they want to trigger you back because they feel unsafe. So they want to make you feel the way they feel. They want to make you feel unsafe too. Mm. How can we work on that gut response, you know, that instinct to just trigger back, to be reactive how can we how can we work on that how can we improve that again that's going back to that they flipped their lid so you you flipped your lid kind of thing so it's it's realizing that if somebody's kind of flipped their lid or somebody's angry you're not going to get a logical conversation from them so the best thing you can do is just kind of like again take a nice deep breath drop your shoulders and just realize like you said it's nothing about you it's how they're actually feeling so let them let their anger out you know you can see it as actually i'm just being a sounding board for them let let them let it out because they'll feel better for letting it out and it's a good thing to let that anger out rather than let it simmer and and see yourself rather you know as oh they're trying to trigger me or they're trying to upset me actually say, see yourself as actually i'm helping them out by letting them let go of their anger and just being a sounding board and sitting there quietly letting them vent it because sometimes often people once they've vented it out if the other person doesn't respond, they're like, oh, I'm so sorry about that, but thanks for letting me let that out. I mean, my, my daughter, one of my daughters is a classic case. She's studying to be a pediatric nurse and she's going through uni and doing assignments. Sometimes she'll phone me up and she'll, mom, I just need to vent. I'm like, okay. And she'll go, <laughs> and she'll, thanks mom, I feel better for that now, cheers. I'm like, yeah, cheer, you're welcome. But you know, because I'm a coach and she knows I can do that. And I love the fact that I can help her out because she said, I'd rather vent in just, vent and get it off my chest with you because I don't want to upset anybody I just need to get it off my chest and, and I know you can take it in the right way so it's really like thinking again not thinking what what's happening with me it's like how can I help that other person and when we sort of put it to them you then become a different sort of person rather than thinking why are they trying to attack me actually thinking how can I help them and that will sort of slow down that, that the mm -hmm. thing of right I need to like say something back because they said something nasty to me it, they probably don't mean but just in the heat of the moment they've they've just said something that they'll probably regret saying for a long time so I imagine this is something that what that sort of develops very organically by itself just with practice so just practicing and becoming able to hold space for your own internal emotions and all of these things that happen inside you as you practice that you'll begin to be able to have awareness of when that kind of thing is happening in somebody else and you'll be able to hold space for them to go through that inner experience and you can hold that space and not have it evoking this yeah. sort of storm of emotion within within you so it's really just a practice it's a practice and, it, and it's also celebrating and now this may sound really strange but I, I, I like to do things a bit differently celebrate when you feel that trigger because that's your body letting you know something that you need to work on to help you process stuff. So when, when a client comes up and they're like, I feel really frustrated and angry. And I'm like, yes, great. Right. Tell me what you feel frustrated about, what you feel like, because it's, it's your belief system. It's letting you know what you believe about yourself. You know, I, I do this thing and I do it on stage and people are amazed. I'll, I'll have a room full of like four or 500 people. And I'll say to them, I'm going to say something now that, 
you're not going to believe and then I'm going to say something that you are you will believe and they're like well how can she be that confident with like a room full of strangers that she doesn't know and I will say right I'm going to tell you something now that none of you are going to believe yeah, okay you know right you're all purple aliens and then yeah that face <laughs> that you just okay yeah. right where's Brooke going with this what, what's happening okay because I said that you that's not in your belief system that you're a purple alien. Mm -hmm. So you're automatically thinking, where's Brooke going with that? It's all about me and what I'm saying, nothing at all about you. So, but if you, um, and obviously like when I'm talking with people, somebody's, yeah, you don't feel good enough. You don't feel confident in an area of your life. And, oh yeah, Brooke's right. I don't actually feel good enough in what I'm doing or I don't feel really confident in some area of my life because it's a belief that you have got that you you aren't good enough in an area of your life but you know it one you believed and one you didn't and the one that you did believe you were, oh yeah Brooke's right and the one you didn't believe you're like Brooke what's the plot here where's she going with this so you see the difference so it, it's actually telling you what you believe and what things that you need to work on because if it feels good like when I was a little girl I wanted to be normal I was so desperate to be normal because I thought if I was normal my mum would love me uh, but you know, she said, oh, she was always calling me weird. And if children called me weird at school, it would trigger me off because I hated the sort of being weird because I desperately want to be normal. But now I actually love being weird and I embrace it. So if somebody says to me, Brooke, you're weird. I'm like, yeah, cheers, thanks. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't trigger me off. It doesn't upset me. So I know that I've changed that belief about myself. So it's it's really good that, you know, when people do get that bit of trigger, that, okay, does that feel good to me or do I need to work on that? You know, like if somebody says, oh, you know, I love, I love your brown hair. Okay, great, great, thanks. You know, but it's actually wrong, you know, but <laughs> it doesn't trigger you off type thing. You realise that you've worked on your belief system and what somebody else thinks about it is just their opinion. Like with me saying, I'm a, you're a purple alien. You didn't believe that at all, but that was just what I said. So that's the difference. And it really does let you know what your beliefs, how your belief system is running. So when you can start working at the programs that are running in your mind and body, the ones that are good for you, that you enjoy, carry on with them. Mm -hmm. The ones that don't make you feel good, the ones that make your body feel tense and, and your body in pain, then those are the ones that you can start working on to help you move forward in your life. Wow, that's really cool. So the things that people say say to you potentially that hurt you or cause some kind of emotional pain is because they're they're sort of tapping into something that you believe about yourself, and that's why it hurts. Yeah. Obviously, you don't think you're a purple alien, so someone could yeah. say that about you, and you're like, "Well, that's not true." But if someone says you're ugly, and there's part of you that thinks I am ugly, it's like, okay, there's a connection there. There's a response. It hurts. Whereas if you intrinsically are identified with, I'm a beautiful person, they can say whatever they want and it's just their opinion. It doesn't, doesn't make yeah. any difference. That's like really said, cool. Like if my mum come up to me now and said, you know, you're still ugly as an adult, I would say, eh, that's your opinion, that's mm -hmm. okay. And it wouldn't affect me. But when I was a child, I used to get really, really upset, mm -hmm. you know, because, the, you know, and I actually used to say to myself when I was about seven or eight, I need to work on my personality and my sense of humor because nobody's gonna like me for how I look because I believed I was ugly because mm -hmm. that was what was instilled in me as a child you know so and and you know when, when people used to say oh um you'll never amount to anything it's like a teacher said that to me that would really hurt because my mum used to say that to me all the time so it was a belief and, and they were tapping into that and I didn't like that and it didn't feel good so it is sort of like understanding and sometimes we don't know where those beliefs come from but we just know we've got them so it's like really tapping into them and thinking, what what do I want to believe instead? Because we can, our beliefs are formed from other people. So, you know, we can actually change those beliefs. They're not set in stone. We weren't born with those beliefs. We formed them so we can form different beliefs as well. And that's the exciting bit. You know, I love it when things, I get triggered about this. I'm like, okay, great. So how do you want to change it? Let's have a look at how we can change it. What triggered you off about it? What made you feel frustrated? What made you feel angry about it? Let's get that anger out and then let's work on that afterwards. It's really cool. It's really cool. I really like that. It's very, very, very good. I really like it. So for everybody listening, what is something that they could do right now for 
minimal expenditure or preferably free? What could they do right now? Whether they've got lots of trauma or a little bit of trauma, whether they're healthy or sick, wherever they are in their life, what could they do right now to improve their health and wellness in their lives right now? Again, that's talking about noticing how they react to, to things. So if, the, you know, so a lot of people have like pains and aches and their backs mm-hmm. and their shoulders, and, you know, they've gone to the doctors and they said, there's actually nothing wrong with you medically, or physically, because our emotions get stored in our body, get trapped in our body, and they, they have to come out somewhere so they can come out in pain. Like when I was younger, I used to suffer a lot with a, with a really bad lower backache. But once I healed from my trauma, the backache just disappeared, mm-hmm. even though I didn't do anything differently. So it's, it's really like thinking about how you hold your body and how you feel about yourself. You know, what conversations you have and like the first chapter of my book is all about self-talk it's how you talk to yourself now how you talk to yourself and I often say to my clients would you talk to your best friend like that and if you did how long would they say your best friend mm-hmm. and they go well I wouldn't to start with but if I did they wouldn't want to be my best friend okay well you live with yourself 24 7 you know you deserve to be spoken to in a kind way you know, just because you've heard it all your life unkind words what you're doing is you're kind of just repeating and prolonging that abuse and that trauma in your mind. So start noticing the things that you say to yourself. Like my mum always used to say to me, I'm clumsy. So when I got older, I'd be like, oh, I'm clumsy if I walked into something. But when we say the words I am, they're very, very powerful because our subconscious mind kind of sits up like a meerkat, like, okay, what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if I say, instead of saying I am clumsy, saying I did a clumsy thing, that detaches us from being the clumsy thing, but we actually did something that's clumsy. Like, you know, you often hear people scream, oh, you're so stupid, or I'm so stupid. No, I did a stupid thing, or that's a stupid thing that happened. So it's detaching. And, and when you say, I am, think about a powerful, positive thing that you can say, like, I am getting better at avoiding walking into tables or something if you're trying to avoid mm-hmm. saying the word clumsy so it's thinking about how you really talk to yourself and what you think about yourself mm-hmm. and also stop thinking like you quite rightly said everybody else is so busy thinking about their own things they're not worrying about what you're, you're doing so what other people think what other people are thinking is what are other people thinking about me <laughs> <laughs> so so just go and actually sort of start enjoying your life and, and realizing that whatever you want your real desires are your underneath desires are start thinking about how you can work your way towards them and how you can start talking to yourself in a better way and notice how you're holding your body because a lot of people are constantly like this with their jaws clenched and quite tense so it's like dropping your shoulders and dropping your jaw the minute you do that you just start feeling more relaxed already. And like if you're constantly got like this, then do the breathing techniques to, to re- reduce that heart rate so you feel more relaxed as well. So your subconscious mind isn't constantly going, where's the danger, where's the danger, where's the danger? It's actually like relaxing so you can move forward in your life as well. And the other thing you can do is actually join my, my free group. It's all about uh, the confidence community. Um, I've I think I've given you the links. If I haven't, I'll... Yes, the links will all be below. Yeah. Um, And that's a free group where I give lots of advice and tips and help about, you know, um, how to keep your body and nervous system calm and how to really think about yourself in a positive way because we are told no so many times more than we're told yes as a child, as a diva. No, don't touch that. No, don't go near that. No, don't. So we automatically go to the the negative. Mm -hmm. And because our mind's always looking for are we safe? Are we safe? Are we safe? It's kind of looking for the, the dangers in life rather than looking for all the, the nice positive things in life. So we have to intentionally work on the positive things in our lives as well. So by being aware of your body, being aware of what you're saying to yourself and being kind to yourself and realizing that everybody else is worrying about themselves rather than what, what they're thinking about you then you can start moving yourself forward. So hopefully the, those few tips will help people to sort of start thinking a bit differently about themselves Wonderful. moving forward. So say you stepped into an elevator and you found a very influential member of the government or somebody connected to health in the, 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 high, the high levels. You have 30 seconds before they reach the floor that they're trying to get to. What do you say to them to try to influence the health of the nation for the better? I would say to them, 
start listening to people and let people be heard and be be seen because that's half the problem a lot of my clients come to me and they want to be heard and they want to be seen but because they're not heard and seen they they feel traumatized about that and they tense up and then they get pain so then they go to the doctor to get pain prescriptions or antidepressants but actually people just want to be heard and believed so it's thinking about working on the trauma in people's bodies and their mind rather than just dealing with the symptoms it's actually dealing mm. with the root cause so it's about communication and having a better ability to to listen to what the public want yeah okay absolutely wonderful so um for anybody that would like to learn more about how they might be able to work with you or more about your book your groups could you could you just give us a big info dump of everything that anybody would need to know if they're interested in finding out more about yeah there's, there's my book. It's called um, You Can Have It, How to Break Through the Self-Sabotage Cycle. And it's on Amazon. And my name's Brooke Bounds. So if you type in book Brooke Bounds into Amazon search bar, it actually comes up. Um, I've got a free group on Facebook called The Confidence Community. Confident to be you, be seen, to be heard and have fun. And I'm also on um, Facebook and it's Brooke Bounds 01. If you put it in the search bar, I'll come up this. I think I'm the only Brooke Bounds in the world. Right. <laughs> it's a very <laughs> unusual name. So uh, it's quite easy to find me. I'm also on Instagram, uh, Brooke Bounds as well. So you can find me that way as well. So All of those links will be below. So everyone will be yep. able to find all of that. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Brooke. It's been lovely to talk with you. I think you've given my audience a lot of takeaways and they're going to have a lot of fun implementing all of the information that you've provided them. Thank you very yeah. much. It's and been if really anybody, lovely to have you. If anybody does want to reach out, I know what it feels like to be traumatized and think, oh, does she really mean to reach out absolutely reach out to me and um i do answer all my messages personally and you can find me at brook at brookbounds.com is my email address as well so um i do reply to everybody personally as well so um i know how important that feels to yeah. feel that to be seen and heard and, yeah. and believed as well so thank yeah. you very much you come off with a very warm energy i'm sure everybody knows that they're going to be taken very well taken care of very thank well you. with you Lovely to have you, Brooke. Thank you for coming. And Thank you for having me. I'm sure we'll have you in another episode sometime soon. Thank you. See you soon. You've been listening to the Holistic Healing Collective with William Dickinson. Our passion is to heal with energy, holistic, and plant medicine using a science-based blend of mind, body, and spirit. We hope you've enjoyed the show, and we hope you've gotten some useful and practical information. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and tell a friend or two. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, find us on Facebook at the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast and support group. We'd love to see you. Take care, be well, and see you next time on the Holistic Healing Collective.